Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited today because we have two guests that are going to come on and talk with us about nonprofit mergers and alliances. And I like that word alliance because it's a it's a broader word um, than sometimes just partnership or sp uh, or sponsorship. We've got Nora Hanna here, a director of the Arizona Together for Impact, and we also have Carrie Harlow, director of Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative. Um, both of these ladies are going to really share their wisdom about what they see across the nonprofit sector landscape, and they also work together. So it's going to be interesting to hear what they have to say about their processes and how it moves forward. In case we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. My co-host, Jarrett Ransom, is off for the day. She will back, be back here tomorrow. Again, we have amazing partners that we've formed alliances with, and we want to make sure that we express our gratitude. It goes out to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that align with us day in and day out. Many of them have been with us since that first week we started uh, four years ago. So um, partnerships are real, and uh, this is going to be a fun discussion to have. If you've missed any of our more than 800 episodes, you can get back to them. You can find us in our streaming broadcast broadcast platforms, our podcast, and you can also download our new app, which will give you a, a push notification every day um, when we upload our, our newest episode, which happens just a few hours after we've done this. So go ahead and download that and uh, you can join the conversation. Okay, Nora Hanna, I have witnessed your brilliance and your leadership in my community over the years. It's been a joy and a pleasure to see you succeed and advocate on, on behalf of so many nonprofits here. Talk to us a little bit about what you do and then Carrie, we will ask you the same question. Well, thanks, Julia. Um, it has been a fun ride, I will say that. Um, and I really am enjoying my role now because I get to support so many nonprofits and their leaders, which is my favorite thing to do. I think nonprofit leaders are my favorite group of people uh, on earth. Um, so Arizona Together for Impact is actually a collaboration of funders, which finally is happening. And I think we've all wanted that to happen as well. They have pooled resources in order to support nonprofits throughout the state in their efforts to collaborate. And we'll talk more about what that looks like as we get into more of the details. Amazing. How old is this organization? Um, we're about four years old, so relatively new. Um, and we're still evolving and changing the way we fund and the things we fund along the way. Amazing. Carrie Harlow, you come to us from the greater Los Angeles area. Talk to us about what you do. Yes, thank you, Julia. Um, I am coming from Los Angeles. I work with the Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative, which similar to Nora's work is a pooled fund. Um, we have about 20 local foundations participating in supporting the work. And we invest in nonprofit resiliency during moments of transition. Um, and as, as we'll talk about today, a big key piece of that is um, you know, exploring partnerships and, and collaboration agreements. Amazing. Now, how old is your organization? We um, were founded in 2012, so we're 11 years old now. Great, amazing. You know, it's fascinating that the two of you have, uh, I would say you're relatively new in time and content or, you know, intent, and then to have navigated through a global pandemic, it's fascinating to, to be uh, part of this like journey that's already a little, I don't want to say fraught, but you know, it, it, it has a lot of things going on. So talk to us about the spectrum of partnerships. I think sometimes we think there's just like one way and there's one, there's one path, but I think you're both going to tell us that's not necessarily the case. That's absolutely right. Um, we actually use the word collaboration as often as possible because the spectrum is so broad in this work. And uh, when we first came on the scene, I think a lot of nonprofits said, oh, this is all about mergers, right? 
that's one thing we do, but I will tell you that funding mergers is, is only about 10% of what we fund. Most of it falls in the other areas of the continuum. So everything from alliances, which are different kinds of coalitions, they can be issue-based, they can be geographically based, but they're a group of usually three or four or more organizations working together uh, to uh, what I consider the most popular form of collaboration. And that is uh, either a joint program or shared services. So, uh, you know, in a way you could be a shared space, shared resources. You may not both be able to afford a marketing person, but maybe you could share one, share a database, all those sorts of things. That's become more and more popular. And then as you alluded to, uh, we do uh, things that would be integrations of two or more organizations. And again, there's a lot of fear around that, but uh, oftentimes it can take forms of of a subsidiary organization where you can maintain your autonomy or fiscal sponsorship. So there are a number of different ways that organizations, particularly smaller organizations, can share resources to have greater impact. So that is that is the main goal of collaboration. Do you find that you, um, and, and, and I'll ask both of, both of you this question, do you find that people are coming to you asking for help or you are outside observing things and saying, hey, group A, should you think about talking with group B? I mean, it's kind of like the Yenta matchmaker approach versus being, you know, the spiritual advisor, I guess. I mean, there seems to be two ways to go about this. It's a great question. Um, there's a careful balance there. The data shows that when specifically when philanthropy gets too involved with the matchmaking, the outcomes aren't as great as okay. when <laughs> then the relationship starts authentically, right? Among the nonprofit leaders, the board members themselves who see alignment and want to pursue it um, because it does require a lot of time and thoughtfulness or, um, and process. And so um, we really can't force it. Although it is our role to make sure that nonprofit leaders know that it's a strategic tool in their toolbox mm -hmm. and make it accessible to them. So it's sort of that that careful balance. You know, it's uh, it's such an emotional concept. And it's a power struggle, I would imagine, at some point, whether we identify it or we verbalize it. Um, so given kind of the human element, <laughs> if you will, because we're all at the end of the day, we're very passionate about what we're serving and how we're doing it. We're working with volunteers, you know, non-paid staff in terms of our boards. So what does the process of effective partnerships or collaborations look like? What should it look like, I should say, maybe? Um, I'll, I'll walk us through sort of chronologically, maybe. Um, so how do we start? Um, where, where does it start? It's important that we think of this as a strengths-based strategic tool. Um, and it's important to get buy-in, particularly from your board for this as a strategic process, just conceptually, well in advance, if possible, before there's a prospective partner at the table. Um, that's what we've learned. And so really just having the conversation openly and frequently as part of your strategic planning process is really key um, to being prepared for when that when that uh, partner comes comes to the table. Um, and then we find often that the next step is organizational assessment. So thinking about, you know, maybe if you think of it as a puzzle, what puzzle pieces does your organization bring to the table? What are your assets? Um, what do you have to offer to a partnership and what are you seeking? Um, so in many cases, maybe um, you're looking for a partner organization that has a different revenue stream or business model, right? Or um, maybe it's that they work with a population you're looking to, um, to reach. So the following, and this <laughs> won't be surprised, the following um, step or phase in the process is an environmental scan. Um, so identifying potential partners and doing it strategically. Um, it's not necessarily the organization closest to you, right? Um, or the nonprofit leader that you have the closest relationship with today. It's about thinking through what you're what you're seeking as an organization. Um, and in some cases, we see, for example, an organization that wants to expand their geographic reach, um, but they want to provide the same programming, right? Consistent programming. So they're looking for partners that have very aligned programming models, but have relationships or 
um, you know, con community connections um, or cultural competency in areas that they don't. Um, or maybe it's a totally different approach. Maybe it's um, that they're looking to connect with the same population, but provide a broader spectrum of services through relationships. So um, there really is no right answer of going about it, but thinking about like sort of what is your, what is your approach going to be? And that informs who you approach in courtship, right? <laughs> who you're going to speak to about a prospective partnership. So I'm intrigued by this because I have to, to say the board work that I've done and, and the organizations that I've done, I, I don't, I can't think of many that have started this way. It seems like they've, they've honed in on a group and then they've like tried to make it work. If that makes sense, that they're not investing in this process in a, in, a, in advance and having that theoretical conversation, Nora, you're nodding your head. Is that what yeah, you've seen? Yes, absolutely. And I think this uh, leads to an important factor in our work that Carrie and I do, which is we um, we generally are supporting having a third party consultant, a technical advisor, work with these groups. And wow. in my uh, you know fantasy world. When you have a consultant working on your strategic plan with you, which often organizations do, right? They have a retreat, you bring in a consultant. And what, what should happen at that moment is the consultant takes you through a process where you pop your head up and look around and say, who's doing what in our community? Yeah. How would we engage with them? How could we work with them in a way that supports our impact? I mean, it's really all about that. Mm -hmm. But if you're in, working in nonprofit, you're harried, you're busy, and so you have your head down just worrying about your own organization. So it's in that strategic planning process that we should be discussing this really consistently. Interesting. And again, I knew the two of you ladies would like set my hair on fire because I don't, I can't ever remember seeing this done, being done in that strategic um plan unless like I to back up unless somebody specifically identified a group but just as a holistic approach to management um it, it doesn't seem like it's being done enough now Carrie in your community do you see it differently I think the the longer we've been invested in this and made it an accessible tool the more it's become normalized right um and boards right there's cross pollination um yep. maybe <laughs> someone who sat on a board who has gone through this process strategically can then bring it to the table at, at the next organization they serve with um or nonprofit leaders once they've built that muscle it there is um sort of um some it's daunting right when you haven't been through it before but to demystify it um and to resource it with consultants that have the expertise is I think the key. Um, and, and it is a really robust due diligence process. I mean, going back to the process of what we know works, um, these neutral third-party consultants walk you through a lot of steps, values alignment, addressing power dynamics, programmatic alignment, financial due diligence. There's a legal aspect, right? Oftentimes, um, addressing board hesitation, getting board buy-in all, all, all along the way. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done um, and so that's sort of what we found is really critical is having that third party consultant at, to help guide you through that process. I, I've got to believe that if you do that, um, you're going to help mitigate a lot of the quote unquote power struggles that that really are more emotional or ego oriented. And so I think that's brilliant, brilliant advice. Let me talk about this a little bit more in depth with both of you ladies. And, and that's setting expectations. Um, Carrie, to your point, you know, not a lot of folks have gone through this process and they might identify it and say, yeah, this is what we need to be. But then how do you do it? And again, you're working with volunteers or uh, as Nora said, you know, a harried staff and yet you're still trying to do your work. And what, how do you do this so that you, you do have that, those expectations that, are going to be realized and everybody's going to be successful. Um, it, go ahead, Carrie, you can take it. Hey, it is key that the realistic expectations um, is so, so important. And that's part of our role, right? Nora and I, as sort of um, <laughs> counselors in this matter um, early on, talking to nonprofit leaders about their own process and how to prepare for it and how, what to expect. Um, so that that is really key. 
Yeah. And really, we have found there are a couple of important factors. One is this takes much longer than people want it to. Okay. They, you know, so to your point, Julia, that. yeah, you're, to your <laughs> point, you know, we've identified this organization. So can we have this done in, you know, a month? Right. <laughs> uh, and sometimes they are rushed and they're generally less successful. You're going to, you're going to pay for it down the road with, uh, when you do go through with whatever integration you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do say bring in a consultant. Um, but the other thing is make sure you set the appropriate expectations about how long this will take. Mm -hmm. And that's why we really want this to be a strengths-based initiative. It, it, very few of what we fund are these desperate last minute, you know, save the organization. There are occasions when that happens. And I'm happy that the organizations do get salvaged and usually it's a very successful integration and saves the program. But generally we like to leave, you know, kind of three to six months at a minimum and anywhere from 12 to 24 months and you engage your board in that process. Mm -hmm. And the re one of the other reasons it takes so long is that the key factor is trust. So you have to build trust. You, you don't, you know, we used that dating analogy earlier, but you, <laughs> you, you know, you don't get married after the first date, right? You, you take your time, hopefully, and you get to know each other. You build that relationship of trust, not only between the leadership team, but also with the board members mm -hmm. um, on how you're going to work together and how you're going to, you know, better serve the community, always keeping that as your North Star. Right. So that's that's the biggest factor of of the setting the correct expectation. It almost seems like if you had taken and I'm going to use the word inventory, but taken stock or taken inventory of what you have, what you need, you know, this this discussion without identifying an organization, you're setting yourself up for for more success moving forward. Would you agree with that? I would. I would. And we've done a couple of webinars that um where we say how to find your perfect 10. And it's it's really, you do want to do a, cast a wide net. Okay. And you also need to know what are your must haves in this process? Like, uh, you know, we what about your mission is so critical? Um, and who do you really need to serve? And could you broaden that or narrow that in the right partnership? So, so identifying your must haves and then the things you would just like to have before you go into these conversations is really helpful. I kind of asked this question and just kind of popped into my mind because I'm, I'm sitting, you know, in a boardroom, looking around the, the table, thinking about times when I've been involved in these discussions. And it seems to me that there's a, another sec segment where there are still founders involved versus organizations that maybe are more mature in in the life cycle of their of their being what do you say to that like what has been your experience when you you talk about i mean founder syndrome we talk about that i mean what does that look like and how does that factor into this this dynamic shows up not just with founder executives but also founding board members still of being oh. involved um there yeah. can be more hesitation and and sort of a um sure. you know a, a sense of um you know not wanting to let go of the legacy or the initial intent right and connection to that an original logo original brand recognition right that, that can be a, a sticky subject for some of these conversations um and that kind of goes back to setting good expectations right so um if you if you go into the conversation knowing what are your boundaries what are the must haves what are the things that the board isn't going to move on it's better to know that up front and have your partners know that up front so that you're not wasting anyone's time. We often do see, though, that these conversations will get to a certain point. And if there's hesitation um, at the board level because of some of these dynamics, oftentimes they pause and years down the road, they'll come back to us during a moment of executive transition or when there's been turnover in the board and they're ready. Readiness is so key and you really can't rush it. So um, that is something that we've seen a lot. It's so, it's such an interesting thing because it gets back to the ego part of this. Um, and especially, I love that you said founding board members. Absolutely, because they're the ones that were, you know, at the kitchen table starting things and then, 
you know, navigating through in, in a historical perspective, I guess. Um, let's talk about this a little bit in terms of overcoming challenges. And, and there's so many, but kind of threading this needle through, can you give us a perspective about what happens to these boards? Um, you know, you, you can't just take two boards and put them together. What are some of the things that you're seeing? Um, and then I, I want to address what are some of the other challenges that you're seeing as well? The integration of boards can be challenging. Sometimes it's the smoothest piece, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's about bringing a really strong board together with one that is tired and yeah. needs sure. needs to be re-energized and through this process becomes more engaged mm -hmm. or has an avenue to step back and take on a, more of an advisory role. And that's sometimes welcome. So it, it's not always a problem, right? It, it, the, the integrating of boards sometimes can be actually a, the, the solution to existing board issues. Um, but certainly there's other challenges along the way that we found um, and going back to sort of the importance of that neutral facilitator with experience in the process, the, it's so, so critical that they create a robust due diligence process that so that you can get ahead of some of those sticky subjects like leadership, like name and brand, like board integration, um, so that they can create a process, curate a process that takes care of those things earlier on so you don't get surprised, you know, at right. the end with these issues. Right. Nora, talk to me a little bit about, you know, overcoming challenges um, and, and some of this, the emotional side of this. Um, how do you separate some of the, these fierce sensibilities that we have in the nonprofit sector with the realities of running a not-for-profit business? Yeah, and you know, that's really at the core of what we're trying to achieve sort of locally and nationally is, is changing the way people think about collaboration in the nonprofit sector. You know, in the I came from for-profit, as you know, and, and if you talk to us about a merger, that was a plus, like, yeah, bring it on, let's have that conversation. But in nonprofit, <laughs> and when I ran a nonprofit, someone suggested it to me and I was supremely offended. I was like, do you think I'm a failure? Um, so why is that? Why do we feel that way? And um, and what we're trying to do is change that mindset among both nonprofit leaders and funders, because sometimes funders get skittish when they think an organization is considering a merger. So we want everyone to think about any of these uh, collaborations as strengths based Mm -hmm. and not something you need to run away from. Mm -hmm. And then getting back to something that Carrie and I have already uh, addressed, facilitators are critical and having a facilitator who really knows this field because you will run into these emotional moments yeah. uh, with board members and executives and you need a facilitator who knows how to take the person aside and talk to them about it rationally. Okay. help them think it, reorient them to the overall goal of your community or your clients. Like, let's think about this. Are we going to be able to serve more children if we move forward? Yes or no. And, you know, so those are the kinds of things as opposed to, and gets you out of your own space, like think bigger, think mm -hmm. about the larger impact. Yeah. Um, and one of the things um, we've why we're at the table as a separate funding organization is to cover some of those costs, which address some of those fears. So in some cases, uh, they have funded um, sort of severance packages or things that may be like, I here's what I'm most afraid of. Wow. You know, it's going to cost us to get out of our lease. We can't move forward. Well, wait a minute. Maybe we can help you with that. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we can be helpful to to uh, support this that you wouldn't find funding for in any other way. Right. You know, we don't have a lot of time left, and I could I could spend the rest of the day talking to both of you because I, I think this is so fascinating. I, I love that you've brought in this concept of the facilitator, and I would love to spend our our last moments with what is the profile of this type of service is this does this is this coming from a law firm is this coming from somebody who specializes in this like what should we be looking like looking at for bringing this this in 
Um, great question. Uh, the consultants that we work with and we, we've developed a roster that's growing. There's a growing national community practice of practice for consultants looking to do more of this work. Um, you know, many of them do other things as well, right? Like strategic planning or sure. executive search. We know that this type of conversation oftentimes intersects with executive transitions, sure. um, but it is a special skill set. Um, and I think that you don't have to be a lawyer, <laughs> but you do have to know sort of how to build a process that um, cares for some of these power dynamics that are often at play and, you um, and can and walk organizations through. So it involves organizational assessment. It involves really, you know, talented facilitators. Um, and then at some point in the process, oftentimes it does also involve engaging uh, legal counsel, right? And and hopefully pro bono legal counsel because it can get quite costly otherwise. Yeah. Uh, but that that does expertise does come into play at some point. Right, Nora. Before we let you go, can you explain to us how? You know, while I have the two of you ladies on, you really are part of a bigger movement. You alluded to this earlier, but this is really a national consortium. And that's my word. I don't know if that's your word, but this collaboration to get our sector understanding this. What is that looking like in that space? Right. We have about a dozen uh a dozen networks very similar to do, doing what Carrie and I do. So Chicago, yeah. Austin, Dallas, Philadelphia, New York, they all have similar initiatives to this work. And there's even a couple who fund nationally in this work and we're growing that field. So Carrie and I actually are collaborators and I will never do it another way other than with a partner like Carrie. Um, in setting up and uh, helping support the national network called Sustain Collaboration Network. And uh, we provide, again, training and uh, community of practice for consultants, because as you said, one of the things about COVID is many of them are working remotely and you could get a great facilitator from Kansas City or wherever, it doesn't really matter. Um, so it really has broadened our ability to work in this space, but we're adding new communities as often as possible. Amazing. Well, this has been riveting. And, and I think this is just a conversation that we need to have more of. And, and I think that, um, as both of you ladies journey through the expansion of this, I want to say concept and, and notion uh, we need to have you back on to talk about this uh, more. Nora Hanna, Director of Arizona Together for Impact. Um, Nora, thank you. Like I said, I've been a fan of yours for so many years. And so it's really great to have you on. Um, Carrie Harlow, Director of Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative, coming to us from Los Angeles today. Um, both of you are doing tremendous work that I've got to believe is going to go beyond your lives in in make structural changes that are really profound. So thank you for that. It's been really wonderful to to meet you and learn more about what you're doing. Um, really exciting times for us in the, the nonprofit show. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, will be back tomorrow with us on our Friday Ask and Answered. Again, we are here today because of the largesse from our partners, Bloomerang American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. Um, ladies, this is a really uh, an interesting time to be learning from you and um, I really love the things that you had to say. I feel like you made this a lot more intellectual and less emotional. And uh, that's a really cool thing because you can only get so far in emotion. Right. Well, thank <laughs> you for having us. It's been great. Yeah, it's been really, really fun. As we end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our guests, our viewers, and our listeners to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.